So um, our presentation style is a little different. I'm an I'm an evolved presenter, evolved presenter. So I like to have uh, participation, and with participation, there comes goodies. <laughs> oh, so you got to earn it. I mean, the whole thing is if you're good about answering questions, or you can answer them, or even ask a really good question, then there are goodies that come along with that. So, so keep that in mind as we go through the material type. So my name is Greg Crawford. So I have been with Wells Fargo for the last 24 years. And um, I've been on both sides of the picture. I've got retail experience and retail side of bank and also business experience on this side. So I've kind of split in half. I've gone with basically 10 and then the rest of it in commercial side. So I've gone both sides of this. So um, I'm excited that y'all have taken the first step to entrepreneurship. Um, y'all have taken the first step, putting yourself in a seat like tonight. I wish these things were around years ago for a lot of business owners who did not have the ability to do it. You need to utilize this. Y'all become a cohort and all work together. Y'all lean on each other to help each other out. You lean on the Rowan Careers Community College Small Business Center to help you out. Your tax dollars are paying for it. Use it. Um, it's great to use it. So I think you're good tools. And I hope that I can be a resource for you. I've got my name up here. It's my personal cell phone and my personal email. So during the courses, if you have any questions come up, are you like advice, or maybe I can give you some assistance in some way as far as putting together things, or just want to bounce a question off of it? Don't hesitate to email me or give me a call. That's what I'm here to be a resource for you. Just because I'm doing a class and walk out of the door, I'm not that kind of person. Pretty much people are in, I want to do that. I want to help develop a relationship with you during this course because you'll see me again in the end. You might throw balls at me then. I don't know what you might do. I might be getting my chocolate back when I come back. <laughs> But, uh, but we want to have a good time and have fun at the same time as we go through the material then. So we kind of broke this down into three different sessions that we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about customer discovery, uh, what that means. That's one thing that we're going to talk about tonight. And we're going to talk about you know, the basic the financial basics, okay? Uh, what's involved in a business. And also we'll be talking about business plan, which I know you'll cover in more detail later, but we're going to be talking about those things as we go through the material. Can I give you a higher review and then you'll, then you'll dive deeper into it a little bit later as you go through the course? But I encourage you to take down notes, um, use the resource pull up again, and, and look at the resources that you can use. And I hope it's going to be beneficial to everybody. I hope tonight when you walk away, you, you said, I'm glad I was here. I, I, I found this to be very helpful. And as you have a takeaway, if you have anything that comes up during this course that maybe we didn't cover tonight, shoot me a question or we'll have a session at the end of the course to answer kind of like a panel to kind of go over the questions that you might have or things you're encountering as you go through the process. But we hope to make it beneficial and be rewarding any way you can. So, so we'll talk about the first thing is, um, let's talk about, you're good you're talking about the, the, the phases. And the first thing, you'll see the word hypothesis. Someone tell me what the, the word hypothesis means. Oh, so I hang up. What is it? An educated guess. Educated guess. All right. You're the first winner tonight. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. I got it. I got it. Got it. <laughs> An educated guess. Okay. That's what the hypothesis is. We want to talk about steps that you go through when you do the hypothesis. And the first thing we have here is a product hypothesis. Um, so you're trying to develop an educated guess of what things are going to look like. So when you develop your product, um, you want to think about what are different things you're going to integrate into your product. And I love we have y'all had all kinds of varieties of products we talked about tonight. And this would apply to any kind of product that you want to do. But you want to think about what you want to integrate into the, into the project. Um, from, from generating the idea, that's the beginning, to coming up with a prototype, okay, whatever it might be. So start to finish, can kind of develop an idea. So that's the first thing you want to do is develop a product hypothesis. Then you want to do then you will do a customer and a problem um, a net hypothesis, okay? So the, the, at this point stage, we're involving customers. So what you want to do here is you want to you find out what your target audience is. Who are you trying, who are you trying to approach with your product? What is your target audience? And as you're doing that, you want to try and understand what problems the customers are facing. Um, where, I, heard, I heard based on some of the things you all said in summary about problems that customer faces. Uh, y'all had solutions for customers' problems, okay? So you want to do that. And then, then you're going to 
then you want to introduce the idea of how is my problem product going to solve the customer's problem okay that's your beginning spot so you have to start with that idea and hypothesis of where that's going to start from then what you got to do then you're going to do you're going to demand creation hypothesis okay so this is where you're going to start into <clears throat> you're going to find out what factors will contribute to, in creating demand uh, for your product so you got to look at different factors what can i do to create demand for my product okay what can i do to do that okay um, so that's what the demand increase hypothesis then you have a market hypothesis so when you think about market when i say the word term market what do you think that means You said, please an audience. All right, very good. Another one. Turn it to the year. Turn it to the year. You catch it? Oops. Got it. <laughs> All right. So you said your audience. That's very true. He's an audience. Um, what audience or what market are you trying to capture? Who's part of that process? What are you trying to capture? Okay. And then whether you're going to are you going to do, you want a small market you're trying to capture, a medium market, or a large market? You have to determine what market you want to go after. Where do you want to start and what do you want to go after? So you have to, that's what the market hypothesis is. All this will make sense and then we get down to the degree. And then the next thing is the competitive hypothesis. So what do you think competition, what do you think that means? What's that? Persons in businesses like you. All right. Somebody's in businesses like you. Who else said something? The, the what? The other businesses in the market. Good. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Very good. Keep y'all waiting while I'm talking. So you want to, so your market is exactly, exactly right. Your competition. You want to find out who is my competition in the area. Um, uh, what are your competitors doing right? Um, how can you elevate that? How can you take it one more step and do a little bit more than what the competition is doing? That would be part of the hypothesis on the market is determining what can I do better. Okay, there might be five, there might be five chocolate shops. Let me take your chocolate. There might be five chocolate shops. What differentiates me? From the other chocolate shops, is there something that I do different from the other chocolate shops? You got to come up with something because everybody likes chocolate, but what, what makes me different? So you got you got to look at your you got to look at your competition and see if you can upscale your competition, see if you can go above and beyond what they are already doing. Okay, that's what the competition is. So we're still in the state hypothesis, so we're all still in the same kind of mode. <clears throat> the next thing is tapping into your network. Who do you think will be your network? Very easy question. Right here, right. You got one network already established. So as you told me, you got a cohort. So I don't know who said that. Who said that first? Did you say it? I said it on the first Okay. All right, you get two then. So, um, yeah, so. What you want to talk about is your you want to develop your you want to tap into your market now that or tap into your you know, basically the people that you're going to talk to your network that can be that can be your immediate friends that can be family that can be your neighbors but you want to build out maybe a potential list of customers and who you want to test your hypothesis on i recommend doing at least a pool of 50 people okay um, i would suggest doing at least 50 and gather your information. What you want to do is um, you want to tap into them and build it. And you want to build your idea, your concept, and talk to 50 people about what you're looking to do and what you're going to do. Okay, that's where you should start off and read that. So, and then what you want to do is once you've got that far and tap into your network, build the number out, making your list of at least 50 people that you want to use while you're developing your hypothesis. The next thing you want to do is you want to prepare your problem presentation. And that's not to mean to be a negative thing. Um, but why do you think, why do you think uh, it's titled problem presentation? Yes. Something that you want to correct or fix with your business. Correct. Okay. All right. You probably have children that are in school, right? They have problems they have to work through, right? They have to learn the concepts. 
So problem is not a negative thing. Problem is a good thing because you want to try to kind of come up with a, uh, a you want to come up with an answer to the problem and what you can do. So you want to prepare that. So <laughs> you're going to create a presentation to your network, your family, your friends, or your whoever they are, and you're going to give some. Um, you're going to create that pres presentation based upon assumptions that you have, okay, about your product, what you think. And then you're going to ask for feedback. You want to have feedback from your network on things that you think are right, you, on what you think your hypothesis is. You want to have them think about those things. And then here you can include a high level uh, product idea description in your presentation. So you very high level, you're going to talk about theory you have, here's what I'm looking at doing, this is what I'm going to do. And then you present that to your uh, friends. And then while you're getting feedback, what do you think is a critical step in getting feedback from this network? As part of it, something that you can be ready for. The downside, the negative, the negative part. Right. <laughs> who else has that? Who, who is that? Okay. All right. So the negative feedback. Thank you for saying that. Negative feedback. So when you think about negative feedback, trust me, it's going to come. Mm -hmm. You're going to hear stuff that you didn't even think about. They're going to throw all kinds of things at you that's going to try to, you're going to feel far as sometimes deflated after it happens. And it's going to happen. That's part of starting a business, you know? But you got to look on the positive. Getting negative feedback is a positive. That sounds kind of stupid, don't it? Negative for a positive. But when you get a negative idea, that, they're actually critiquing your idea. And that negative feedback, they're probably going to tell you, oh, maybe you should consider this. But then maybe you haven't thought about that idea. So in front of your network, they're trying to help you. They're trying, they're trying to test this thing out and see if it's something that's really going to work, if it's really going to work for you. And so you have to learn something without a bias. And you can't pull the bias. And even if you create a product, you got to learn without having a bias. And don't ever create your network a bias because this network of people you build, or somebody may you come back to later when you've got your final product, right? So you're trying to build some positive vibes about that. And the way you receive that feedback is how your customers will receive it, right? The way you receive it is how your customers. Yes, Peter, you're going to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to amplify on that a little bit, which is one thing when you're, when you're doing customer discovery, one of the most important things to understand is that you are not the customer. That, that's a mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make, which is they assume that they're the customer. So the way they feel about the problem is the way the customer or the market is going to feel about the problem. And that is a false assumption. You are not the customer. The customer is out there somewhere. Okay. And in these discovery interviews, what you're looking for is how they feel about the problem, right? So you don't just go out and pitch a product, right? What your, what your, let's use the chocolate for, uh, company, for example, okay? So if you're doing a customer discovery interview, you don't say, I'm making this kind of chocolate, here it is, would you like to try it? You don't do that. You say, um, or do you like chocolate? Yes, no. If they say no, then, you skip that one and you go to the interview where they say yes. They say, well, how are you currently enjoying chocolate? Where do you buy it from? What do you like about that experience? What do you not like about that experience? Is the chocolate good, bad? Are you buying it online? You know, or so what you're trying to discover through the customer discovery is how the customers feel about the problem, right? You're trying to solve the problem, but you want to make sure that you get insights in the customer's mind. And how are they currently solving the problem? And how can your product improve their experience and take that problem off their hands, right? So that's this core critical insight is you are not the customer. The customer's out there and you're trying to figure out how they're experiencing the problem, how they feel about the problem, how they're trying to currently solve it, et cetera, et cetera. That's in a lot of the supplemental resources that are online. Okay. Yeah. Peter, said, Peter said it perfectly, right? Yeah. 
It's about the valuable insights, okay, that you're going to gather from all of your clients, uh, from your from your network. Um, you're going you're going to make sure you have to uh, uh, when you do that. Uh, you're going to get valuable information to help you through your thought process as far as what you're going to do going forward, how you're going to accomplish things. So you have to get rid of all your preconceived notions about what you think. Okay, it comes kind of from the customer perspective. And um, in fact, if you pay, um, if you're if you're generally, generally curious about your product, you want to know how it's going to work. You're going to take these these moments in your interviews as probably the most valuable dollars you're going to spend. To yourself and developing your product. Valuable time. That's what's going to help it. So that's all part of it. I mean, you have to explore how people feel or why they're different about different things. You have to explore those things out what goes on with it. So that's what you do on the inside. So the next thing is you have to map out. Why? What, what's a map? All right, give you directions, right? Okay. How does a map give you directions? I mean, it's going to give you like the step-by-step where it comes back to the okay. and what path to follow. Good. Um, it gives you more detail even to show, okay, well, you go this way, you want to have to stop here. Um, you take this room, it'll take you here, here, but you're still going to stop. You go this way, you know, people on to the next thing. Next right. Very good. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. So you have to map out your infrastructure and what that's going to look like how you're going to proceed with that. Um, so not only have to reach out to prospective customers, as we talked about before, you got to reach out to competitors and learn exactly what they're doing. What is your competition doing? Um, how are they shipping product? Are they using us? Somebody here talking about going to a manufacturer, manufacturer product. How are they doing that? Can I better that step? You know, those are those are things you want to do. You want to map all that out. You want to have a step-by-step -step process. You want to learn exactly what's going on. Um, you also want to learn about current market trends. Where's where's the market trending? Um, um, keep on the chocolate example. Where is chocolate consumption going? Is it rising? Is it going down? Is it stabilized? Um, is it seasonal? I mean, what what are things that, that determine the infrastructure if you're marketing your chocolate product? You know, what does that? So to do this, you're gonna have to go out and engage with industry and out uh, analysts. You can do Google searches on the web. You can go like you know, every business, and I might be, but every business as you establish your business will have IRS has a SIC code, SIC, SIC code, SIC code. And when you file your tax return, that categorizes you into a business, okay? And you can find industry analysis by that SIC code. You use a four digit code that you can go out there on the web and, and once you determine what yours is and look for industry analysis on that SIC code. A lot of banks have that. Well, as far as we have. Tons of back office analysis that tells about the future of the bank and the future of an industry where it's going, hotel, motel, could be whatever industry, manufacturing, where it's headed to. Every industry you've got, but that's identified. But you want to, you might also take and invest and go into a conference, okay? Um, a lot of early y'all develop its retail product, but you might decide to go to an industry conference and that retail business that you're going to be in. Why you go to find out what everybody else is doing. They also have helpful seminars to help you out. So attend those conferences to help you out. That'll help you. Um, you'll get a better understanding too of the environment. They'll share things with you. Um, then once, once this phase ends, once you get that infra infrastructure started, then you can go out and start uh, modifying your hypothesis. Once you started earlier, you might have to make some modifications to that based upon where you started and where you're headed. Um, and the, the more you expose your hypothesis to other people, the more you're going to learn and get a better understanding of what's going on. You'll be able to identify specific problems. There. Okay, here's what others are not doing. Here's the problem. Well, how am I going to fix that with my problem? How do I make mine stand out above everybody else's? And that's what's involved in that. You have to start doing that and go through that part. So all that's part of the stating the hypothesis process, okay? One step of that. I know it's a lot of you. If y'all go back and look at this, and I haven't got my notes. We can somehow get those uploaded on the website too, but you can kind of read through those things and gain those things. Yes, ma'am. But does that ever end? If you're saying that they're going to come back with, you know, they're going to have something. So, like, I have a CBD store. Well, hell, there's 10 other ones that's talked to the bears. So, right. if I'm looking at 
you know, one that has five other outlets in other, in other cities, it seems like I'll always be trying to figure out what to do differently, what to do better, how to one up. Is that cycle? It sounds like it doesn't stop. You're on the right target because my last slide. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, you're, you're good. On my last slide, when we get to the discovery process, at the very end of it, you're going to say, oh, do I need to repeat this over again? Maybe I've got a, maybe I've got a concept in mind that through my learnings, I'm like, oh, I need to go back and do it again. So this whole process can go over and over, depending on what, depending on how you want your business to evolve, based upon your learnings and what you're finding out. So that's called a repeat process. You know, you don't continue to evolve and yep. you make changes, and you're just going to mess with everything. Right. 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 So, we'll talk about that in a minute, but say you're on, so we're in the first cycle, so it's an repeat. So, all these slides that we're showing you can start all over again. Okay. It's not a one stop shop, it's a kind of repeating process as you gain the learnings and understanding of the process. Okay. So, let's move on to the next step. Testing your hypothesis, all right? You've got it formed. Now you want to go out. Now you want to test it. So, um, so you want to test your solution at a much wider scale. Now you want to broaden it out. Okay, you had just fifty people you tested. Now you want to broaden that out and test it to a wider audience. Okay, so <clears throat> you got to establish if, if what you discovered and covered is relevant uh, to the people you're going to be selling to. You want to make sure it, it fits a problem that they might have. Um, you want to uh, make sure it's attractive enough to uh, to charge customers because they want to see value of what you're providing to them. You want to see that happening, and then take all the feedback that you gather, um, and you're going to basically once you gather all the information, you're going to share um, share the customer appreciation points with your product development team. So once you kind of broaden it out, and then now you're going to take all the points you've learned from your customers. And what value brings to them, you're going to share them with the team that's developing your product. Okay, so all the homework you've been doing, now you're starting to develop your team. Okay, you have a product development team to help you build out the product, whatever that might be. Okay, and it could be multiple products, which means you might repeat this process over again, like we talked about. Um, so you're going to do all that. So you might find that your product is a partial fit for the market, but you got to make changes. Okay, you might find you take it to the market. And based upon what you're seeing, like, oh, that ain't quite working. Maybe it could be anything. It could be the packaging of the product. It could be anything. It could be the way you market. Um, it could be the audience that you're selling to. You might find it, you might need to modify that a little bit and make minor changes to the project. So that's what you've also got to do is make sure you understand that part of it and work through it. And you might find um, you also think uh, in that case, you're gonna go back and you're gonna redevelop that. But there's four things. There's five things really key, I think, to developing uh, the key product. And these are here. First, a product requirement document. That's what your product is going to be. What develop a document that names your product and what's in that product, what are the requirements of the product, what things you want in your product based upon your research. You want to do that. The next thing is you want to develop a sales plan revenue. Um, here you'll need to set a projection over a specific time. You might say, okay, what am I going to do the next month? What am I going to do next quarter? What am I going to do next year? You want to develop within your mind where you see yourself going on this roadmap about where you want to take this and where your sales are going to go, what your plan is going to look like. A business plan. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because we'll talk about that here in a second. But the business plan. You want to talk about the business plan and where it's going to take you um, as far as developing your product. It's a comprehensive. That's a comprehensive overview to people that you're sharing with of what your venture is all about. Then you want to develop a uh, product plan. A product plan is it outlines the directions and the objectives of your product. Okay, the outlines of that. So you, in the back of your mind, you always want to have that ready and available to share with other people and doing that. And finally, um, you will come up with an MVP. And that's a minimal viable product. So what it means is the smallest amount of money you invested for your product gets the biggest gain. It can start changing people's lives. Okay. So the smallest amount you have invested, what minimal amount do I have to have in this to make this product viable and move on and go on to the next step? That's what you want to have to do. So these are the steps that are involved in uh, testing um, the hypothesis. I have another question. Yes, <laughs> go ahead. All right. So for your plan, your sales plan revenue, I mean, is that are you guessing? Because technically, like if I'm if I'm an established business, 
Like you have to look them up the OS to see what I've been looking up. But if I'm developing something, even if I have a forecast, I don't necessarily know what I'm going to do. So how am I creating that plan? I'm not even sure. Yeah. 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 So that goes back to the earlier steps. When you're you had the 50 kind of you had the 50 kind of people you tested, yeah. you kind of get a vibe from them about how they feel about buying the product. Okay. But then when you expand that market out to other people, then you got to determine am I doing a small, medium, or large scale? And then that based upon that information you gather, and also if you're going, you've done your industry research about what the trends are as far as what's an average sale. What's okay. I'll give this example, I'll keep using chocolates or some got chocolates out there. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the average consumption of chocolate for a person? What is that? Would they buy, how much chocolate would they buy in a year's time, or maybe in a month's time? And there are things you go to research all that. That's part of your research and other steps. Based upon all that research, then you can get to this step. Okay. So, you know, I pull out here, it's all part of this hypothesis. You try to develop, you know, what's going to be the right what I'm to use. Okay. And checking out the competition, too, like we talked about earlier. So, Doing that kind of step as well. So what they do. It's also about how you're going to go to market. Mm -hmm. uh, most most early stage companies um, double it, it find that they over forecast their sales revenue and under forecast their expenses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. so what you have to think about is okay now that I've identified who my Customers are that I want to reach. How am I going to get to them? Um, you know, and you have to make some assumptions in your sales plan about what's rational. You know, about how many customers I can actually reach over a week, a month. You know, is it brick and mortar or is it e-commerce or is it both? You know, and you're going to be saying, well, I think I can execute x amount of unit sales in each of those channels um and then you're going to test that and find out whether you can actually execute on on that sales strategy and that growth market strategy so a lot of it is like figuring out how you're going to go to market and what your you know unit volume sales are going to look like in the different channels that you choose for your go to market strategy Question. That's something we can help with too. We yeah. can help you with financial forecasts, yeah. making those assumptions. You want to track the assumptions too. So you make one, write it down, and then as you get real data, you can replace it. Right. That's the whole idea here. Is the whole idea about uh, identifying your hypotheses, testing them, and moving on is you, you have to identify the assumptions in your business. Test them, get a yes or no, and if it's no, dump it. If it's a yes, amplify it and, get, and take it to the next stage uh, until you know you've tested out enough assumptions that your business plan gets more and more real. That's so it's it's really it really is using scientific method. Um, I've got a, a hypothesis. I'm going to test it scientifically with a cohort of customers. If I get validation, then uh, I know that the I've got a customer group that like that product solution. So I'm going to build that into my MVP. And then, you know, your customers are going to punch you in the face and say, well, I'd rather have this, or I, you know, they're going to start talking about features and all these kind of things. So then you're going to have to go through these iterations of testing the assumptions until you really zero in on what you know is your your the right product fit for the problem. And that's part of the last process you talked about. You talked about the verification process, and I've got these kind of bullet points that was kind of talking. You have to evaluate, or validate, the identify problem solution. Make sure you validate. You found the solution. If you think the solution, what it is. And then now you have to make the final call where you're ready to next move, or if you said you're ready or, or even halt the project. This is the part where you might say, okay, I gotta go back, I gotta change some things, I gotta re redo what I did. But the thing you gotta do most is keep the customer first by evaluating their feedback. Okay. 
You know, you might go to places where you give out samples. That's probably what you're doing because you want to test the market to see what it looks like, okay? And you, you evaluate feedback received from them and uh, start, with product, start with the product development team to get back to the uh, product development team to answer questions such as, has a customer problem been verified? Um, is a customer solution verified? And you want to determine if your model is, is going to fit the solution. Is it sustainable? Is this something I can keep doing or keep going on? You know, and uh, it might it might not. You might say, "Oops, made a mistake. Got to repunk and start all over again." You know, so the other part of being a business owner is you have to be one say, "I've made a mistake," and don't take it as a failure. Take that as a gain. And you're not going to do it. And that's what part of this verification process is going through that and making sure you understand how it's going to work. Don't be afraid of negative feedback. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. You just repunk and do that thing. Yeah. Use all your sources to help you. One of the key concepts here that's really important for you guys to understand is you're, you're trying to make, first you want to establish problem, solution, fit. Before you run off and spend a lot of money and resources on developing a product. So the more, you, more time you spend on problem, solution, fit, the more likely it is going to be when you go to build a pro the product, that address it, that answers that problem solution fit, then you're going to have a product market fit, right? Because the customers told you that it was a fit. The customer said, you are solving my problem and your solution is a fit. Now it's up to you to build that product that, that captures that, that market that, that you validated when you were doing our hypothesis test. So that's, that's kind of what it looks like. More time you spend on that upfront hypothesis testing, the less money you waste, the less time you waste when you're actually fine tuning your product and looking for the market that wants that product. Also, interesting about that is sometimes you'll run into like, there are people interested in solving that problem, but it's not such a big deal to them that they're looking for your solution. Right. right. Or that they're going to pay. Yeah. That. Or that they'll pay you what they think deserve. Right. <laughs> right. right. Whatever it is you're bringing right. to them. So right. that's also surprising too. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell them, oh, I thought I could get more money for this versus yeah. they're like, oh, I'll spend $25. What? Yeah. <laughs> so that's so what it costs to make. Yeah. One of the questions you want to ask in these discovery interviews is how are you currently solving this problem? Oh, and how much are you paying for that yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that validates what, what they're currently paying for a, a less than what you believe is a less than ideal solution to the problem. So that gives you a, and then you can ask, well, how much would you be willing, if you could wave a magic wand, <laughs> and have the perfect product that solves that problem, how much would you be willing to pay for that? So you're, you're kind of trying to figure out what's the bandwidth, uh, what's the pricing tolerance. So uh, Adrian has uploaded some resources that help walk you through how to do those interviews and get those insights so that you reduce the amount of time that you waste trying to figure out what it is you're trying to pay for. But also, I've been designing my own stuff like my own sample. I'm not sure all of this, but it is a challenge. I tell people that they're like, just $125 for that bag. I got to go on Amazon bag. Don't short change when you get that. That's where I'm going to do it because I have to take $250 on my bag. And then they're like, I would pay $500 for this. I'm not going to go to the bag. It's not Walmart. Stop telling them to go to Walmart. Don't necessarily charge you yourself because other yeah. people need to purchase your say, right. and I appreciate your, your feedback, but yeah. I believe that product is not this. And you will. Yeah, that's, that's right. part of finding the market, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So for your product, you know, it's it's not, you know, going to come up. Right, it's not shaving cream. Right, it's not a commodity on Amazon. Your product is a, is a article first. So you have to find you want to find the customers that are interested in article versus and then find out, you know, what are you currently buying that satisfies that urge or that need? 
And what are you currently paying at that zero sale on your actual flight? Mm -hmm. I'll wait for me to. Yeah. That's true. I do mean, like the way I sell it. Um, we have an experience. We're offering an experience to you um, when you eat our food, when you, you know, when we um, cater to you or whatever. Um, it's the experience that you're paying for. So, sure, you can buy steak anywhere, but like, it's like, I don't know, I move Chris. Their steaks are very expensive, but they're not anything fancy. You're paying for the experience of being at Ruth's Cruise. And so uh, I, I think um, you're right. Like, we don't change our prices at all. Like, and I ask people who would who try to haggle with us. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, mm, that's okay, but thank you anyway. Because, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just like uh, the value added that you buy the product. It's anything I'll pay extra if I'm going to get the attention and the value that I want out of our product and they give me special choice. It's like it's like United States Postal Service, FedEx. Okay, I go to United States Post Office and say, okay, I want to have, I want to pay, pay you know, for mail. Um, is it guaranteed two days? Well, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> you know, what about FedEx? I know I might get two day delivery. You know, I pay for that, so I'll pay extra for that. But you pay for what you give for. Mm -hmm. And don't, ever, like I said, don't, don't ever be afraid of, of what you have. Don't be afraid to say no. But also, you won't price it though, so you don't price yourself out of the market. Mm -hmm. So, so that's knowing that that's knowing your clientele, like you and the making the the purses or the food things you make. You're going to compete with people that are in your market, not people out Am not Amazon market I'm not, people. I'm not yeah, you're not Amazon market people. You're going to a different market. You know, so that's part of it. So, all very good comments. Yes. Don't Right. It's like, and I'll use my example. I, mean, I work at a bank. You know, the customer calls me, first thing he asks, what's your rate? I'm like, well, I, you know, that's like me coming to a hot doctor. I want you to tell me how to fix the problem without giving me all the diagnosis you have. So, you know, I mean, you're in the bank, I hear an additional guy besides a rate. You know, who's going to meet you at 7 30 morning, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock at night? He's going to call you with something wrong. You know, all those things encompass your product. And that's part of testing hypothesis out and say, okay, how am I going to? There's an earlier slide we talked about outdoing your competition. You know, how you outdo the competition and in your market, not never outdo your market. So, all right. Kind of like a small break. You said we're going to take a little break. It seems like five minutes or something. I mean, um, before we start the next section, if I need to. Get up your restroom. We can we can pause here for a minute and start back up. You want to? I think I've got the times right now. Yeah, so five minutes. Yeah, five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Right, we'll start back. Yeah, one hour and coffee. Seven fifteen. We'll start back. We'll take a little break. It's it's fun.
All right. That's good. Get to know everybody really well. That's good. I'll keep the conversations going up. You know, if you all develop the group and you know, share everything about what's going on. So, the uh, next part of all this is deals with uh, business planning, which I think is a very, very huge part of your business. I'm trying to business plan. I know you'll have a, a lot more on that. There's lots of resources that are on the website, the learning management system. They give you access to the kind of technology and tools. But what I just want to talk about is why develop a business plan. The first thing is it's going to help steer your business as you, as you, as you start to grow. You have a starting point, have an ending point, hopefully, I continue to keep, keep going. But you got to know where you're going. You got to have a roadmap. You got to have something in your mind behind all this, where it's going to take you in your business plan. You're going to need to, you're going to, or it's like a GPS mapping system. You get the car, and nobody uses the fold out maps anymore. <laughs> Everybody's got a GPS or phone, they plug in the address. And you're, you're talking to somebody, and you say, uh, I'm going to come to your house tomorrow. Night. Well, what's your address? I don't need to know. Used to say, turn right, here, go stop sign, turn left, turn right. I ain't more just plug the address in. But, but the business the same way. You have to have them back, and you have to start your point, and you've got to have an end point. That's part of what it is in developing your business. Um, and it's not as hard as you think. You know, I think what happens is many people get frustrated when you think about the big picture. They won't break it down into smaller bites, okay? Smaller bites if you work through it, okay? Um, it's like build the house, okay? You know, you think the whole thing, wow, it's gonna be hard to build this. You break it down into small bites and take it each step as you come along the way. Um, you think of it like your business. You know, it's not, and this is not a one-time document that you develop for your business. It's not one time, okay? Um, you're going to break it down to small mini plans. Uh, one for sales, one for marketing, one for pricing, one for operations. And it's like when you, when you move into a new house or before your house or when you get in the house, you've got a dining room, you've got a kitchen, you've got a living room, you've got a bedroom. Well, do you try to do all at once? No, you probably take a room at a time. Okay, what do I gotta get in my bedroom? What do I need to put in my kitchen? What do I need to put in the bathroom? You break it down a little sub steps to kind of get you to the end point. That's what you want to do and build a business plan. You want to break it down. And in each part of your business, you're gonna have a pricing team, a marketing. Um, as you're building this out, each the business plan will help you kind of work through all of this. Um, it's gonna help you meet milestones. You want to have targets, okay? Um, if you don't have a target, you'll never get there. And it's like going down a road and not know where the end target is, not where the house is at. I gotta have a target throw at, so I have something to throw at and, and put my dart, so to speak, so the land to hit on the spot. Um, whether you're doing a business plan or not doing a business plan, it doesn't matter. You still gotta have a plan, no matter what happens. Um, the plan doesn't have to be like an encyclopedia either. <laughs> you don't have to write a 50 page document about the business. You know, that's not what you wear. It doesn't have to be that detail. You want a basic plan that you can understand. You can you can you can tell others about your plan and what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish. It doesn't you don't have to have all the answers either. Okay. Now you're going to count things you don't have all the answers, but then you'll learn that's something I got to find out about. Let me go get it. Um, I don't know the answer. Let me go get my resources. Let me go find out how to get an answer to that question. You know what you on that. Um, it can help you get funding if you have a business plan. I know y'all gonna talk a lot more about this as you go into funding and different funding sources. But having a basic plan that talks about your story, we're gonna talk about that in just a second. And then finally, having one, having one in place will help investors feel confident they are seeing a return on their investment. If you go out to investors, or you go out and apply for grants or different things, or especially an investor, if they're gonna invest in your business, they wanna see a good return. You know, um, I get a kick out of watching Shark Tank. You know, I'm watching, you know, and they come on board and they're asking for, I want $50,000 for a 5% investment. All you have to do is do the math. I don't know if y'all knew it. Do y'all know how to come up with that number? You take your dollar amount divided by the, 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 uh, the amount of investment, 5%, and, that, and they're telling those investors what my company is worth. Sometimes those numbers are going way, way, way out. But you know, you'll see people on Shark Tank, they'll do this kind of thing. Y'all are not Shark Tank. Don't be like the Shark Tank. You want to be 
<clears throat> you want to be informed decision type. That's what you want to be. That's what you want to be part of. Um, and there's not a wrong way to write this. <laughs> you put it together. There's not a wrong way. You do it in your style. What works for another templates you can use to teach you there. We're going to look at one. There are templates you can use, but you, you know, it's not, it's not, um, there's no wrong way to write. You might write it, you might read it a couple of times, you might, you might have somebody critique it, and you might change it around a little bit, okay? But you like that. Okay? Um, most business plans are, are very traditional kind of plan, and some are very lean. It depends upon how you want to set these up, the way you want to do it, which you want to look at. Um, all right, let's see. I'm going to go look at one. Hold this up so you can see it. This works. Where were we? I'm going to get right up so you can look at it and see what it looks like. This is a business plan kind of template that you can get in something else. Like you want to try again. All right, here's a business plan. It's written by, uh, it's written by, this is a person that business plan, Rebecca Chan, the other three of the 2016. It's just an example. Of what we're here and what it looks like. Um, so you can kind of see, show what it looks like here. Okay. Ah, perfect. Okay. So there's our first page. There's a second page. It's got an executive summary. Um, these are generally on the, um, on the website, the tool, the resources, but it has a product. It says we can do consulting provides consultation services to small and medium sized companies. Our services include office management, business process engineering to improve efficiency and measure costs. Then she goes and talks about her customer base. Who are her customers? Uh, CEOs, five to 100, 500 employees who want to increase productivity. So she describes her customer base that she wants to have. With her. Then she talks about what's the future of the company, um, what her plans are for the future, what they want to be going forward. Then you have a mission, every business should have a mission statement. So you develop your own mission statement of what your business is all about. What do you want to do? It might be like this person here to provide quality service or clients that will help your companies prosper and grow. Um, you know, if it's a chocolate product, you might say, I want to, I, um, I want to sweeten the mouths of every person in the US, United States. You know, I'm just using an example, but did you come up with kind of a mission statement? It fits what you're trying to do, you know, whatever it might be. Okay. Then you don't call it the principal. Who are my key players? Who are my principal members of this business? And here to list Rebecca Champ, she's a primary consultant, my God Champ, a business manager of sales, and Sophia, Cynthia Roberts is a captain. She'll list that there, okay? And then you're gonna go on down to, to do your legal structures. Okay, I know you're on the program again. I think uh, y'all will talk about this later, but <clears throat> Um, you're going to develop some kind of legal structure. You're going to tell people on set up as an S corporation, in this case, on set up as an S corporation. Most small business owners are S corporations um, where they file a fictitious name file. And they go to corporate. Most of them will file an S corporation. The reason being, you don't get double taxation. So when you file a tax return, you might file an S corp return and a personal return. But what your business makes is not taxed twice, only once, because that the, the profit you make with the business passes over to your personal return, and then whatever your personal tax rate is what you tax. Do I understand that? Mm -hmm. So most people will do an S corporation, okay, because it helps your business taxation wise. Okay. Use the big boys or C Corps, the Wells Fargo or somebody's really huge in size or Amazon or any kind of thing. So can I amplify that yes. just a little bit? All right. So the the form the, the, the form of business is, uh, most most people actually start start as a sole proprietorship right so they're they're not going to incorporate yet they're not going to you know go through those expenses the, the the time when it's time to move from being a sole proprietor i.e 
you're just working out of your personal resources and typically your personal bank account and so forth. Is when you enter into your first sale or your first contract, at that point you you want to move to some form of incorporated entity, okay? Uh, because at that point you really need to start separating your business transactions from your personal transactions, so that you don't have commingling of resources and you know you're keeping your personal life straight and your business and keeping it separate from your business life. Um, so you can go for a little while as a sole proprietor. The, from a legal standpoint, there's a lot of liability involved in being a sole proprietor because if, if, you, if you do some harm to a customer or you know, if you get, get into a legal issue, then your personal assets are not protected. So incorporating protects your personal assets. Right. Um, most early stage companies either form an LLC, which is a member be membership based corporation, or an S Corp for the tax advantage of the pass through of profit and loss to your personal return. So it's your tax basis is your individual tax rate, right? So uh, when you uh, start considering outside financing to fuel the growth of your company, then uh, either being an LLC or a C corporation comes into play because you're either going to be issuing membership interests or stocks to your investors. And you cannot do that as an S corp. You can't do it effectively. It won't play in the investor market. Uh, so we, that's something Adrian and I can help you with. If you want some advice and counsel on the form of incorporation, what's best for me now, and when should I consider changing to something else as my business grows and evolves, Adrian and I can help you know, walk you through that and counsel you on that, right? So, yes. um, so it's something, it is important to think about and to make sure that you're kind of on the right track and kind of form of incorporation that you might might be undertaken. As you grow CPA or account, or routine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now wait to tax time you ask for advice. Okay. Set up a quarterly meeting with your account. That way you can have an advisor to advise you throughout the year. The tax laws that change. You know, that's a key team member of your you know, how you play with it. So the, the key for a lot of you that are just getting started, the key is don't remain a sole proprietorship too far into your um, the initiation of revenue and contractual work and things of that nature because it's it's very risky. You want to separate your personal life from your business life and have a uh, a liability shield, which is what corporations are all about, whether it's an LLC or a corporate C corp. You need that liability shield to separate you from uh, your personal assets being in danger. I know you're on top of this, but. Yeah. Yes. 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 I know some companies don't go home and it's free, it takes four seconds. Mm -hmm. The government contract, especially that website, is kind of crazy, mm -hmm. but you don't need to pay somebody. It's a free thing, it takes a few steps, and they give you the number right there. Yeah. And just print it out, give it to your personal give you your business reference. So don't pay somebody to do your VIA. Yeah. There's people I've seen two, three hundred dollars for a 10 second yeah. thing that you can do yourself. <laughs> if you go to, and I'm speaking with my bank account. If you get an open account at a bank, you're going to need that EIN yeah. since we're good point. And you're going to need to have the filing done because um, don't wait for your post office to mail it to you. When you're online, you print your letter right there and you take it to the bank. Instead of waiting in the mail, it might take two or three weeks to get that back to the IRS. And then you'll need that along with if you do that uh, filing. Whether you, if you do a sole prop, like a fictitious name filing, or you're going to escort, that information is needed to open your bank account. Those are very critical. EIN number 
the do business filing, petition filing, or the export filing or LLC filing, failure to need a different business bank account. Just do those steps up front, save you a lot of headache later. So, I guess that's so. So, um, in my case, we have gone through the process of getting the that all kind of, should they uh, all be separate LLCs or should they be listed just as DBAs? So you have, you have multiple business names, is that what you're saying? I do. So like we have a main uh, uh, catering company, but like um, Dynast Infections kind of like is our baking, is our bakery. But then I also have uh, rugs and uh, and in the process of doing a um, actual like restaurant type of thing, so it's all under the same umbrella. So should they all be separate LLCs? There's two you know, two answers to that. Well, I can give you the best I can. Um, the someone who wants to maybe have different sub companies, so to speak, you can form a holding company if you have an LLC. It will be a holding company, okay? Then each of those businesses would have ownership in that holding company. And I keep getting you might say, this business has 25%, this one has 25%, the other one has 50%. Ownership. You form a holding company to house all the subsidiaries that you have, okay? That's one solution. Or secondly, you said you can develop a name for each one, set up an LLC or an escort for each one, or it's a piece that you did like that. And um, you're gonna be keeping separate books yeah. Everyone. You're going to be doing separate tax filings yeah. and you're going to drive yourself crazy. So, but most businesses have multiple divisions yeah. within their operations. Yeah. Um, so I, in your case, it would be a better use of your resources, most likely to have a single corporate entity and to have divisions within that corporate entity where you might you know, track the, the P&L by division. decided to sue a bakery and we're under that main umbrella would that freeze our assets from for everything potentially yes that's a that's a question to ask the lawyer I'm not oh. <laughs> yeah it, it, it does potentially put, put other assets at risk mm -hmm. and that's a there is a whole different path legal wise with all your business centers most of them will have operating agreements the different agencies, you know, what, what can what can my business do? Who can, who can do those actions? That's a separate kind of a discussion to have. So these are all things we talk about during the course of this class, so it's not for a call or whatever we can walk through and so forth. Um, um, okay, market research. This person here did a market research. We talked about the industry. So she described what industry she's in. We talked about the hypothesis from the part of it, the industry she's in. Uh, Give a detailed description of your customers. You know, who am I going to reality to? Part of your hypothesis, you're going to define who your audience is going to be, or who you're going to market to. You're going to talk about company advantages, which would make you stand out about everybody else. Um, and then uh, regulations and the regulations we have to meet. Uh, we've got specific codes here that have to follow. Um, and then you've got the service line here, the product service line, what, what they're going to do with their services. The pricing structure is built in up there on um, the life cycle of the product, the intelligent property rights. You know, do they have any of these things that are 
trademark or anything like that. What they're doing our research and development. Um, marketing and sales, you know, what's my growth plan? What, uh, how are we going to communicate with customers? I plan to sell. Um, so that, that's it. I mean, that's, that's a basic business plan. And they're broken down into different areas. And this is available online. You can go to the SBA website. And they have a template that can be used too. So there's a lot of places, places the, the, the road reverse, the small business center can help you develop business plans. It's all that. All the all that can be done as part of that process. So, um, anyhow, I just want to point out that I think the business plan is a part of documents you should have on your business, and it it's an evolving document. <laughs> when they which create is done, it's going to continue to make changes to it and go back to it as you as evolve and go into it. So, um, I'm going to say Greg too. I like to just to be something on the lead campus because I'm a visual person and mm -hmm. I feel like those are really nice tools too because it's just one page but it has the different boxes usually that you fill in to answer all those questions. Yeah. On, the, on the learning management system there's uh, what she's referring to is, is kind of a predecessor to writing a business plan. You can organize all of the components that ultimately will be in your business plan with a simple to use visual tool. So depending on what stage your business is, you know, if you're just, if you're very early on and kind of in the discovery phase, you may want to use that tool. So that's also on the LMS. Um, this is another document on the SBA website. It's a small business resume template. That's basic information about yourself. Your name, your address, that type of thing. Uh, basic questions here. Then think about your educational work experience because a lot of some people, some of y'all might have been working for a company, and you say you want to go out and do what your company's doing, do it in a different way. And so SBA is going to look and say, okay, have you got any work experience in that field? Instead of saying, I'm going to start a restaurant, where have you been working at? Well, I've, I've been a CPA for the last 10 years. Well, I don't know where you're going to run a restaurant. So I'm just using that as an example, but, but if you're in the same life business you've been working at for 10 years, you want to go out and run that's what, that's what the SBA is going to be looking for. They're going to be looking at trying to venture out and go over there. Okay. All right. Any comments about that? Yeah. So I think it's just a good thing for you to do and fill out, have it handy, so that you can kind of go through all that process. I want to show you what it's going to look like. Yeah, um, you should be realistic about those things because if you, if you don't have, so uh, use this example, if you're a CPA that wants to open a restaurant, um, and obviously the bank is going to say, well, you don't have any experience in that, so that creates a lot of risk. That might be the reason to partner with a co-founder that does have a lot of restaurant experience to get that on their team. Or to have advisors, formal advisors to your company that have a lot of restaurant experience. Because yeah. it's, it's not that the CPA experience is not valuable, it's just that you know the line of business that you're seeking to launch requires that expertise. So you should think it, you should look in the mirror and think about what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses. Should I have uh, partners, consider partners, or consider key employees that are going to supplement my weaknesses? It's called a SWOT analysis. You heard of SWOT: strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The things you can do as a business owner, kind of think for you to kind of do your own inside assessment yourself you know, about where, where, where things are at, you know, those kind of things. So, the next part of this is your financials. This is a very, 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 very high level of your finances. <clears throat> I broke it down simple assets are what you own, liabilities are what you own, and then your equity is the difference between the two of those. Okay? That's basically what it amounts to. So, you know, you do a basic financial statement, you're going to write down everything you own. It could be the cash on hand, which you have the banks, it could be the accumulated inventory, it could be the cars and the vehicles. Um, all of those things are part of it. <clears throat> your liabilities are basically what you owe. Um, and we want, there's liabilities are classified short term, long term, short term is under 12 months. Anything over uh, debt that's over 12 months owed is a long term liability. Okay, you know, basic financial business statement. And then <clears throat> the difference is your equity, retained earnings. That's really key. When you go to 
start applying for loans and you're looking maybe at an S4 return, um, your tax returns are going to attract the equity. They're going to track distributions you take out of the company. And if you see that, you see that uh, equity number start shrinking, get negative, that's not a good thing. <laughs> and you want to kind of, you want to be, um, you want to make sure you're doing it the right way. There's nothing wrong with taking a distribution for the right reason. Most escorts will take out um, a distribution to pay their personal tax bill because they had good profits. That's what that's what most most good uh, practices are. They're taking out equity to either pay taxes or maybe they have a new part of the business that's growing and need equity to kind of infuse into that and get it going. That's that's basically a kind of high overview of that. That's where and you always want to make sure the assets liabilities um, that the assets equals liability and equity. So what you what you what you've got your equity into it, and what you owe equals the assets. You want to make sure they balance out, okay, um, in that situation. So these are basic things. Assets would be something like valuable, but you own, uh, money value, such a car, a house, a cash, and then you also have intangible assets. You might know what goodwill is. Not the goodwill store, but what goodwill is. It's the value of your brand. Right. So if you develop a chocolate and that chocolate becomes really popular and you decide that um, people are buying that chocolate because they know the person who made that chocolate, okay? Um, or it could be a, a trademark kind of thing. They're buying that brand, okay? They're buying your name. And that's what Google is. You develop a name brand for your product and they're buying that. that there's a value that puts on it. Um, liabilities could be short-term, long-term. We talked about that. And then you have personal liability, which could be credit card, bills, personal loans. And then you also have business liability that are taken out on the business side. Loans that you have on behalf of your company. <clears throat> then you have business financial statements, which is very basic. Your basic ones are a profit and loss, or we call income statement and balance sheet. So the balance sheet for a financial statement is the same as your personal financial statement. So you have those assets, you know, um, Equal your liabilities and equity, it's the same on the personal financial statement side. Um, so you'll have the same thing on a business. You'll have the business assets, you have the business liabilities, and you have the equity that you have on the business side. And so it's very basic um, information. What does it? It tells um, it tells where your firm stands in a set period of time. Um, capital is also very critical. Um, a company can have acquire funds to um, equity or debt. So Equity is, is what you put into the company. Would you, would you either keep the earnings you make, you keep in the company, that's equity you're put back into the company, or it could be debt. You might borrow money for a specific need. You might, you might borrow debt, $50,000, but to offset that debt, you've got the asset. You have the vehicle or the bought. So they match each other, okay? Um, so you talk people get a negative equity situation. That's because when your car is upside down, <laughs> as we're talking about, you owe more of what's worth. I can get a negative situation. So that's what we're talking about here is you want to make sure you got to keep that balance there. Um, cash flow statements. Now, cash flow statements are a little different. A cash flow tells where your money's coming from and where it's going. And it's a summary of your financial statement, but it tells you uh, a business owner, if, I, if somebody's looking at that, they can look and see how are they funding that business? Okay. Are, are their account receivables are going up? And they haven't collected them yet, and that's a funding source for them. Did they borrow money? That's a funding source. So there's different, different sources of revenue and income that you can have. That's what they talked about. And then everybody knows what everybody know what compound interest is. Everybody know about rule 72? Everybody know what that is? Take 72 to buy entry, tells you how long it's gonna take your money to double. 72 divided by entry tells you how long it's gonna take that dollar to double. That's from rule 72, just a basic throw out question. Compound interest, usually, these are some basic terms that you can have with that. Okay? Um, this place can be your friend. You talk about funding tools or funding avenues that you can use to fund business. Uh, United States Small Business Administration is a great access and tool that you can use. Okay? Um, they're the organization that manages these things and they're funded by banks. Okay, and the government doesn't get all the money. What the government, what, what the SBA does is they, they basically guarantee a loan. So if a bank makes a loan, 
to a company, they do it through SBA. The bank's given all the money to the customer. But what happens is the government comes in and they back that money. So if you belly up or go upside down or go out of business, the government comes in and they pay back to the bank what, what was it? Okay, that's what SBA is. They're a tool to go get money, but you, they're all funded through banks or organizations. There's nonprofit organizations. We'll talk about that um, here in a second. I'm sure maybe during the course of this time, we'll get there. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. They've got all kinds of plans and programs. I mean, <clears throat> when COVID 19 was going on, the SBA, if you had an SBA loan, you know what they did? They waived your payment for six months. Two years? Okay. You pay the you account program you're in. I know people are talking about customers. Um, even this year, they kind of did some extension of that. If you got a loan, you got approved by a certain date, they waived the first three months of payments. So there's lots of things that SBA will do that a normal bank would do, but because it's an SBA loan, the banks compile that and you're able to do some of those types of things. Um, so there are different types of SBA loans. It's not be something you might use in the future down the road, but there's seven A loans. Basically, these loans are like a house loan. You can borrow money to fund the purchase of real estate. If you're going to buy real estate at some point in time, you can use SBA to buy real estate. So as little as 10% down, you can buy a piece of real estate. And 9% of them will be financed by the bank. Okay. Good thing about it is they're long term loans, like 25 year loans. Most of them can be on a fixed rate. So it's just like a house loan. But the government's backing down the bank. So that's one that's one happening for you. So $20 we put on our banks, fixed interest rates available to you, five to 10% down. But then you have 504 loans. 504 loans are a little different. Um, they can be used to fund real estate and also equipment. The difference is, they're all they're still funded by a bank, okay? But usually a bank will fund 50%, and then some kind of nonprofit organization will come in and fund the 40%, and then you have your 10%. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So 50% by bank, 40% by a nonprofit organization, and then 10% comes out of your pocket. We'll talk about that here in just a second about what some of those things look like. Banks and a nonprofit organization, banks 44 years in, and you have a fixed interest rate. So some numbers I saw recently on these loans, you could get a 25-year fixed rate on this loan for 2.25%. It's really cheap. And so it's really a good place to kind of go after you get things. Um, BevCore is one of BFCORs that are off the year. BevCore is one organization that can be used for the 40%. They're a nonprofit organization, they're based here in Charlotte. If you go out this Google BevCore, um, you can apply on their website, but there are sites that you can use to fund things like that, okay? You don't have to decide to participate in a bank. They'll, they'll let you know where to go to get that. A lot of banks are involved in that. Wells Fargo uses them, I know uh, Bank of America does. Um, I'm pretty sure bb and does. Um, a, lot of, a lot of different banks um, are participating with BevCore to fund that 50%. But they, that's your starting point. You go with them, and then we get and kind of cover those kind of things. Okay, uh, this is our place. There's a website. Get to it. There's a phone number for local local phone number. Again, these slides are all on the, on the page two that you can do earlier, but it's called Bedford, BFCR com. So that's one place you can go to. Um, venture capitalist. I don't know what that is. Snakes. I'm just kidding. Ah, snakes. <laughs> snakes. Right. Uh, yeah. The shark takers of the world. That's the shark takers of the world. Somebody like that. That's what a venture capitalist is. Shark taker of the world. And you have partner companies. So you might have friends or family or somebody else who wants to be a partner in the business. And they might want to fund 30% of the time you start the business. And that's an area you can of things. Um, angel investors. You know what angel investor is? What's that? No, so okay. angel investors, good angel investors, are people that you guys know very well before you accept their investment. Uh, and they have your best interest in all this. Uh, they also become consultants for you, too. They, they want to see you succeed. They don't give you money back out. 
they're still involved with you if you get lots. Sometimes you come in and see the girls, like before you see them, it's going to take off. They, they kind of show the week that you know, there's, yeah. So there's a lot of funding mechanisms, which again is another way that uh, we can help you as advisors on this course. The cheapest form of funding is revenue. Yeah. Um, because that doesn't, you don't give up equity, you don't have to pay a loan back, you know, so the one of the best forms of funding is to focus on actually generating revenue by solving a problem that customers, you know, joy have to solve by product. So there are other forms of funding, like crowdfunding, for example, is non-dilutive, uh, form of getting a large crowd to participate in, in funding the early stages of your company. Uh, angel investing involves giving up an equity stake in your company. Um, you know, so they, we can go into detail on all these yeah. different methods of financing. You, you want to make sure that you go down the right path for growth capital. Um, so that you know you're you're kind of serving your best interests and, and protecting protecting the company by making the right decisions. Right. And this is kind of giving you a high level overview. I know you'll get into more details. You can force it on some of these things. Yes, ma'am. What's the best way to open the crowdfunding? Like seed and spark. I'm sorry. Seed. Seed and spark. Seed and spark. So there are new crowdfunding yeah. out there. They're not okay. right. Yeah, there's a, a lot of platforms, so there are crowdfunding platforms. But if they will not be posting with their marketing plan, yeah, all this stuff. Yeah, they will not. They might be already running this, but I'm not. Yeah, they actually walk into the door. Right. There's to be. Yeah, uh, we're getting in the weeds a little bit. Yeah, we can clear about this. There's two different forms of crowdfunding. There's Kickstarter type crowdfunding, which is non dilutive and doesn't require um, taking an equity stake. And then there's equity based crowdfunding, which is a, a form of raising capital that's similar to a public offering, but it's, it's done within the borders of the state. And it, it's done with uh, strict SEC or, you know, regulations and requirements, which require Things like due diligence, and you have to put uh, a certain type of information up for the people that are interested in investing in the company. And they become shareholders in your company, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, the navigation of that and the selection of how to satisfy the capital requirements of your company is, is, is something that you all are going to have to. Figure out and get a lot of advice on from the Camara Center or the Small Business Center or the SBA. The, on the CDFIs, there's a number of CDFIs in the Charlotte region. Self Help is the biggest. Um, and then uh, there's a new one called the Spire Capital, which is very focused on uh, women and minority businesses, um, which is very relevant for this crowd. So, the community development finance institutions typically step in before SBA. So they do micro loans and, um, and they'll take more risk uh, and uh, some of the requirements that are put in place by SBA. So the CDM, CDMIs are a source of debt financing for very early stage. And one of the last points we talked about was grants. You know, I have, have $3,500 to put on the table and maybe get in the seat tonight. That's pretty, <coughs> pretty good when you start out with You can have a team of five for grant and $3,500 worth. It's probably about $100,000 college. That's really yeah. good. Yeah. And if your business is mission oriented, private foundations might be interested in grant funding, providing grant funding for private foundations. Yeah. Um, so that's a good question. Point is that's not a little bit of funding that you're not giving up any of your money. Yeah, it's helping you get your business down the road. There's also another thing for any club. There's a Prosper website. There's different places you can go. 
get them recovered. So these have to be kind of looked at too. Verbal debt, you know, it's, it's virtual cash advantages don't go down there. But, you know, you, the virtual cards are made to money before you get the sale, and then they take the money back and use pretty high interest rates. And these are just different things that are made. But um, one of the last things I want to talk about is how you give yourself credit. Um, I, I'd say review your credit report regularly. Um, and your dashboard credit bureau is the most three commonly used are Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. Um, and you want to check your credit scores. It's called the FICA score. You heard that people have for a house or something. You know, they say, what's your FICA score? What is it? Well, they range anywhere from 300 to 850. Um, uh, you want to verify your income and debt, check your debt information. So you want to do your own analysis. You say, okay, monthly debt, I have 1,000. Well, my income is 2,000. So I'm like a two to one ratio. So you kind of want to look at, you kind of look at those ratios. Most times you're applying for a bank loan, you don't want to have a one and a quarter to one ratio or greater. So banks look for you say, Sometimes one and a half, from a dollar and a half of income to a dollar of debt. That's kind of what banks kind of look at. And I don't know if you do this enough, but all of you, this website can pull your credit report on an annual basis free of charge. Okay? So you go to each of the bureaus and pull a free of charge. Now, what I suggest, since you can do that free of charge, you don't get your FICA scores, but you get the credit report out, see if there's anything on it should be on there. But maybe every three months, Maybe, I mean, every four months, say the first four months, you might pull, most people in this area will use Equifax. So you'll pull Equifax the first four months. Next four months, you might go pull Experian. And next four months, you pull TransUnion. And the back time you're in the 12 month cycle, you start all over again. But this is free of charge. It doesn't affect your credit score at all when you pull your own credit. But this is available to everybody. Did everybody do that? Okay. Um, if you're starting a business, Good time to start pulling this so you know the information. Okay. <clears throat> and then purchase small lines and pay them off each month. Um, and put your gas on the car and you pay it off each month. I mean, my daughter, I'm trying to teach her about credit. And she's in college, but I told her she, you know, she uses, gets gas and pays for it for her debit card. But I said, why don't you just start paying, buying your gas on a credit card and then have it automatically pay at the end of the month? And then she'll go and sometimes she'll pay it before you come to do have it set up on auto pay so that way just your gas is going on there and do that and you know the short time that my daughter's at it i mean she's been two years out of college and high school the scores are up to like a 730 which is really good for someone coming out of college and you know working a part-time job but, but start early and start small and help build your credit they build small things you know um that's really important i think um pay out pre um regular occurring items on your credit card, they allow it, and we're going to pay off each month automatically. Now we don't have to worry about our credit auto pay or something like that, but that'll help build your credit up when you want to build your, build your credit. So, that's all the time it is, I kind of finished up in one minute. Well, 78, okay. <laughs> so, um, again, you've got my phone number over here and my email address. Um, and please don't hesitate to give me a call. And I'll be back to see. Me again, at least one more session with y'all like towards the end. But as you develop questions, you have questions about or know about, you know, feel free to call. Um, I'll be glad to assist with email me questions if I have. I'm mean, actually walking through, especially on the banking side of things. I can definitely talk to you about that and uh, get you going in the right direction. So I hope, I hope what I've shared has been helpful. I hope everybody got a piece of chocolate. <laughs> I got more if you want more. I'm thinking I put some on advice, huh? Yeah, all these slides are up there. Thank you.